Friday night we had the service here. Uh, Good Friday evening. And I mentioned then the most important event that has ever occurred in the history of the world or will ever occur in the future is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything before that anticipated that event. Everything since then is based upon what God did in Jesus Christ. We must understand, no matter what we know about anything else, we must understand and know the importance and significance of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to look for it with you for a few minutes into 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 15. It, it is a chapter in our Bibles on the subject of the resurrection of the dead. It is not the only place the Bible talks about the resurrection of the dead, but it is the fullest discussion of that topic. The Corinthian church was in the city of Corinth, a Greek city. And it's helpful to understand something of the, what the Greeks thought about the matter of immortality and resurrection. In Greek thinking, the soul was immortal. So no problem with the Greeks talking about the immortality of the soul. But the Greeks did not believe in the resurrection of the physical body. General Greek thinking. They believed the soul would return to God, be absorbed in God upon death. They were opposed to any concept of the resurrection of the physical body because the physical body was not good. It was the cause of our problems. Um, It was the source of evil. Remember when Paul as recorded in Acts chapter 17, went and spoke in the city of Athens on Mars Hill. They listened to him. But when he spoke to them about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, they began to sneer. Um, That was not something that they could agree to. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is addressing the church at Corinth, and is confronting an issue that had become a source of concern to him in the church at Corinth. Teachers had come into the church and were beginning to influence the thinking of the church that there was no coming bodily resurrection. They didn't necessarily deny that Christ had come, that he had died. The issue was not really the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because it could explain it away by saying, well, he was not only man, but God. So his resurrection was a spiritual resurrection associated with his returning to the realm of deity. Whatever they're thinking, they denied bodily resurrection for believers. That's not something that is dated. That kind of thinking goes on today. Let me read you uh, just a couple of comments by more recent writers. Uh, More recent within my lifetime and some of your lifetimes as well. Some of them very current. Uh, One writer wrote this about the subject of the atonement, Christ dying to pay the penalty for our sin. He says, too many theories of the atonement assume that by one single high priestly act of self-sacrifice, Christ saved the world. In other words, he died for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son in order that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. That concept of Christ by one sacrifice providing salvation for the world, he calls that a theological disgrace. Uh, 
move on a little bit uh, to a couple of other comments. The church's fixation, and this is a different writer, but current writer, the church's fixation on the death of Jesus as the universal saving act must end. And the place of the cross must be reimagined in Christian faith. Penal substitution, the idea that Christ paid the penalty for us by his death on the cross, is a vile doctrine. And for men who are part of churches, who are leaders and pastors in churches... One says, substitutionary atonement is a pre-civilized barbarity. We've outgrown it. It's by a man who, he does, he's not trying to destroy Christianity, he's trying to bring it up to date. And uh, then on the subject of the resurrection, which we are focusing on today, to think that the central meaning of Easter, the resurrection, depends upon something spectacular happening to Jesus' corpse, misses the point of the Easter message, and risks trivializing the story. To link Easter primarily to our hope for an afterlife, as if our post-death existence depends upon God having transformed the corpse of Jesus, is to reduce the story to a politically domesticated yearning for our survival beyond death. Let's read those in examples. The issues facing the church at Corinth 20-some years after the resurrection of Christ have not changed. Even within the church, among people who claim to be Christians, There are those who deny the importance of bodily resurrection, the significance of Jesus dying on the cross to pay the penalty for lost sinners. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul addresses this, and I just want to highlight some of uh, what he has to say here as a reminder and encouragement to us. Paul begins chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians by clarifying what is the gospel. What must we believe to be saved? He starts out in verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you. Here's where we start. I'm going to talk about the gospel. This is what I preached to you when I came to Corinth. Secondly, it's the gospel which you received. They accepted it as God's plan of salvation. It's the gospel, thirdly, in which also you stand. That is their present hope of their future salvation. They stand settled in that. It's the gospel by which you are saved. This is the saving message of God. Paul put it in Romans chapter 1 verse 16. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So these four things about the gospel. It's the gospel which I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand. It's the gospel by which you are saved. If you hold fast this word, unless you believed in vain, maybe that's not what you believed. Maybe that's not what you trust in. That would be an empty faith. You believe something different. It was important to understand before he clears the guy the gospel here even further what the content of it is. There is only one gospel. There is nothing that can be added to it. There's nothing that can be taken away from it. 
This is the only gospel that saves. It's not a matter of, well, that's how you understand it. That's how you interpret it. We must be clear on this. Leave a marker here and just turn over a few pages past Corinthians to the book of Galatians. First and second Corinthians and then the book of Galatians. Paul wrote to these believers in churches in the realm of Galatia where he had preached the gospel and established churches. And he says in verse 4 of Galatians 1 that Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins that he might rescue us from this present evil age. He goes on to talk about the concern he has that some in these churches are moving away from the gospel that he preached to a gospel that's not the same. It's not related to what he preached. What the Galatians were doing was adding other things. This truth about Christ, we're going to add to it. You must also keep the Ten Commandments. The commandments of the law is given to Moses. You know what Paul says here? Verse 8. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is accursed. Even an angel from heaven is not allowed to make any alterations or changes in this gospel. He repeats that in verse 9. He reminds them in verse 11, the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. I received it neither from man nor was I taught it but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the message from Christ to us regarding salvation. Any changes in it, doesn't matter if a person says, well, an angel appeared to me and said this. If he makes any changes or alterations in this gospel, he'll be anathema, cursed to hell. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul reminds them it was the gospel that these Corinthians had heard Paul preach. They had received it. They had planted themselves as those who believed in it. It was the gospel that saved them. Verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. This is not something I thought up. I received it. Remember what we read in Galatians 1? I received it. In a revelation from Christ, directly from uh, Christ himself. This is the content of the gospel. There's four points that summarize the gospel. This is what you must believe to be saved. You cannot believe anything less. This is what the problem at Corinth is. They want to take one of the points out. You can't believe anything more. That's the problem the Galatians had. They wanted to add something to it. There are four things here. Each begin with the word that in your English Bible, if you have the same translation I do. Here's what I received. First, that Christ died for our sins. Secondly, verse 4, that he was buried. Thirdly, in verse 4, that he was raised on the third day. And fourthly, verse 5, that he appeared to Kephas and so on. Those are the four points that summarize the gospel. If you believe anything less than that, you cannot be saved. If you add anything to that, you cannot be saved. We look through it. It's not a matter of your interpretation versus my interpretation versus someone else's interpretation. This is what God said. He allows no room for varying interpretation. For example, the first point. That Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. I read you. Those who said substitutionary atonement is a vile doctrine. That person be saved? 
They don't believe the gospel. The gospel is Christ died for our sins. He was our substitute. He wasn't dying for his own sin. He came to pay the penalty for our sin. Christ died for our sin. There are people in church this morning celebrating Easter who don't believe that. You ask them, do you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? Yes. Why? Oh, I'm a good person. Well, I do good works. I try to live by the Ten Commandments. That's not the gospel that brings salvation. The gospel is Christ died for our sins. The penalty for our sins is not keeping the Ten Commandments. The penalty for our sins is not trying to live a good life. There are people who think they get baptized to be saved. The penalty for our sins is not being baptized. I hate to tell you this before I'm done, but the penalty for your sin is not even listening to my sermon. (laughs) Coming to church doesn't save you. Christ died for our sins. And that's consistent with what the scripture has said through the Old Testament. The great chapter Isaiah 53 that prophesied the death and resurrection of Christ. All the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament were a reminder the wages of sin is death. The one who sins will die. So the first point is Christ died for our sins. Secondly, he was buried. You're going to see a major point and a sub point in these four points. They become two major points, two minor points. The minor point supports the major point. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. That's the testimony and evidence of his death. He was buried. That supports the statement he died. And he died for our sins. A number of years ago, there was a book out and somewhat popular at the time, The Swoon Theory. Doesn't mean it's all gone away. But I got him up the idea Christ didn't really die on the cross. He swooned. He was so overcome it looked like he died. But when his disciples took his body, then they were able to, uh, you know, give him refreshment, get him going. And people thought he died. And then when they saw him, they thought he must have been raised from the dead. Oh, his burial was evidence of his death. That's why the Roman soldier ran the sword into the side of Christ before they took him down for the cross. Roman soldier wouldn't make a mistake of taking a man off the cross before he was dead. You know what had happened to that Roman soldier? If it was found out that that man hadn't really died, that Roman soldier had to be executed. I mean, they're not some kind of indifferent uh, activity going on here. Christ died. He was buried. He was put in the grave where his body would remain for three days. After that, the third point of the gospel is he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The culmination, the demonstration of his victory over sin and Satan and death. He was raised. The fourth point, he appeared. You can see that supports the resurrection. The burial supports the statement he died for our sins. His appearance supports and gives evidence that he was really raised from the dead. But these four points comprised the gospel that Paul preached. And he lists some of the witnesses to the resurrection of Christ. These are not necessarily given in order. They are not, this is not a complete list. If we go back and look through the scriptures, we find others on other occasions. We've looked at the complete list uh, of those that he appeared to. But there's a summary to show The evidence was overwhelming that Christ was raised from the dead. 
He appeared to Kephas, that's Peter, then to 12. That's the title for the original 12, even though Judas is never not part of it. The 12 still became a title for the group. Uh, after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Now, the resurrection of Christ had occurred uh, over 20 years ago from the writing of this letter. Paul says he appeared to 500 at one time, most of whom remain to now, but some have fallen asleep. During that 20-plus year period, some of those Christians who had been together in that group, uh, we're not told specifically when this was. Perhaps it was when he met with them in Galilee. Remember at the end of the Gospel of Matthew? Christ instructed them to go to Galilee and there he would meet with them. And it may be the word was spread then and that's where the 500 met. Uh, we're not specifically told, but we're told here of that event. Then he appeared to James, then he appeared to all the apostles. Paul says, last of all, he appeared to me. I'm not telling you this just because I've heard eyewitness accounts. I'm telling you because I am one of the eyewitnesses. And Paul never lost the perspective as we've talked about often with Paul. The fact that he had been saved by God's grace, appointed as an apostle, one so unworthy and undeserving. Last of all, as one to untimely born, he appeared to me also. Um, after everyone else, he appears to me. So he is too an eyewitness. He can testify, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. I saw him. As these other witnesses could testify. And uh, he testifies to God's grace in the following verses. Then you come to verse 11. Whether then it was I or they, whether it was me or Peter, one of the other apostles, one of the others who saw Christ raised from the dead, so we preach, so you believe. That's where he started out in verse 1. I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you're saved. Then he says, pull together the facts of the gospel. So wherever you heard it, this is the gospel. This is what you believed. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? And you note, even as I read you some comments from those who are part of churches, so it was at the Corinthian church. Some in that church were promoting the doctrine that believers wouldn't be raised from the dead. They have eternal life their spirit, their soul is immortal, but their bodies won't be raised. Well, if we're preaching Christ is raised from the dead, and that's what we preach to you, that's what you claim to believe. If that's not what you believed, you're not saved. If you believe anything less than that, you're not saved. If you believe anything more than that, you're not saved. Do you understand that? I sometimes hear people say, they say, oh, I believe in the death and resurrection of Christ. But I think also you have to do this, this, and this. We say, well, they're probably Christians because they believe in the death and resurrection of Christ. A true Christian, one who has been saved by God's grace, is one who believes the gospel for his salvation. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. That's Paul's point. If we're preaching Christ as a resurrected Lord, how could some of you in the church at Corinth say there's no resurrection of the dead? Well, they might, as I mentioned, say, well, Christ was not only man, he was God. He's a unique case. But you understand, he is unique. He's both God and man. But he is fully God, and he is fully man. 
He is not in any way less than fully human. So when we talk about his bodily resurrection, we're talking about the resurrection of his physical body. So Paul's going to make the point here. Christians get confused. The Corinthians were confused because they didn't stay focused on what the scripture said. They begin to, well, that makes sense. That seems logical. That seems reasonable. The only issue is, is it biblical? If there, verse 13, if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. He was man. He's called the Son of Man. That was his favorite title for himself during his earthly ministry. The Son of Man. He's fully human. If there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, note this, then our preaching is vain. Your faith is vain. Verse 16, if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. We have some kind of idea, and it pervades the religious realm. And Christianity, broadly speaking, people say, well, if you have faith, that's what matters. People will say to you, I have my faith. What does that mean? We have faith-based organizations. What is a faith-based organization? Well, but all people who have similar things. We believe certain religious principles. That does not save a person. These teaching at Corinth, these false teachers, had faith there was no bodily resurrection. They had their faith. They weren't denying that Jesus died on the cross. They were denying that believers would be bodily raised from the dead. They had their faith. Jesus said, if you don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ, and the subject one meaning that means that Believers will be bodily raised. You have a worthless faith. It's vain. It's empty. It can do nothing for you. This idea, why have my faith? You shouldn't judge me for my faith. We don't all have to believe exactly the same way. We have to all believe exactly the way God says we have to believe to be saved. That's it. You don't have to believe like I believe. I don't have to believe like you believe. But if either of us are going to be saved, we'll both have to believe what God has said, not what we think or we think should have been said or we have reasoned out. That's Paul's whole argument here. Verse 15, he makes it clear. We are... Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God if we're claiming bodily resurrection. We testify against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. You know what? If you preach contrary to what God has really done, you are opposing God. So he says, if I'm preaching to you that Christ has been raised from the dead... And that's not true. I've taken my stand against God. Oh, oh, I think he could be sincere in doing that. That has nothing to do with sincerity. The idea, well, we get this idea that if you're sincere, if you really believe it, that's what counts. Doesn't count a bit with God. And Paul doesn't try to hide behind that. If I'm telling you what is not true from God, then I am opposing God. I'm declaring something that God says is not true. That sets me against God. Uh, 
Verse 16, if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not, has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Those four points of the gospel that he laid out in verses 3, 4, and 5. They all have to be true or none of it's true. That has to be the complete package or it's not worth anything. Um, the Spirit of God put this here because it's an ongoing tactic of the devil to spread partial truths. Like a man who believe part of this. He says, I'm not denying Christianity. The background for what one of these wrote, I am updating Christianity to bring it into the civilized world and so the church can be relevant. Who has declared God irrelevant? This is what he says is his power for salvation, the gospel. These are the facts of the gospel. Well, my church believes you also have to be baptized. Your church is teaching a lie. My church teaches that you have to partake of communion well, to be saved. Well, your church is teaching a lie. Well, I heard somebody say, if you don't go to Indian Hills, you're not saved. Well, there's another lie. <laughs> I mean, you know, we just stay on focus. That's what Paul says. This is not my message. It's God's message through me. Look at verse 18. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. You can't be forgiven your sins by having faith. You can only be forgiven your sins by believing in the truth of the gospel, what he set out. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. They weren't saved either. They believed in Christ. They believed uh, that they would be saved, they would believe that their bodies would be raised and they would spend eternity in the glory of his presence, they perished. Uh, they're doomed. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. This idea, you know, you can believe a lie and get some comfort for, from it. A little while ago, we had a man in Wall Street uh, Bernie Madoff, I think was his name. And you know, he perpetuated a lie. Give me your money and I'll make you rich. And you know, many people gave him their money. And they had faith that when they retired, they would have a vast fortune to live on. And they had comfort in that. You know, some of you have seen the interview and they talked about how excited they were and how they were looking forward to being able to do this and that. They found comfort in that lie. But you know, that lie did not produce what they were looking for. They believed a the lie. They got comfort from that lie. They felt assured by that lie. But they ended up with nothing. That's the way people can be with their religion. They say, oh, I believe this. I find comfort in this. I'm confident in this. The issue is, are you believing the truth? If you're believing a lie, you will end up perishing. That's Paul's argument. That all depends on the resurrection of Christ. Our resurrection depends on that. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. The resurrection of Christ is the guarantee we will be resurrected someday. That's our hope and anticipation. He's the first fruits, guaranteeing more to come. And it's by the comparison with Adam, who sinned in the garden and brought sin. Christ, by his death on the cross, brought life, and he will ultimately bring victory over sin and death. Uh, come down to verse 33 and 34. The nursery workers the first hour told me they were going to turn the kids loose if I went over time. <laughs> One of them even went so far. 
has to threaten to bring the dirty diapers in. <laughs> oh, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. <laughs> now what he says in verse 33, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. We sometimes pull this verse out and it has a broad application, but note the context he's talking about. Become sober-minded as you up. Stop sinning. Some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He's talking about the situation in the church at Corinth. You didn't change subject. You allow yourself to be associated with these false teachers and the false teaching, it will corrupt you. And I say this is a sad testimony to you. There are some there in your congregation who don't know God. Because those denying the resurrection have not experienced God's salvation. They have no knowledge of the salvation God has provided in the finished work of Christ and his resurrection. And the Corinthians are tolerating it. Later in his second letter to them, he'll say, if somebody comes and preaches a different gospel, you bear with that beautifully. You know, we feel the pressure. So, Christian, we want to be tolerant. We want to be broad enough. You don't have to believe everything like we believe. And, uh, you know, this is serious business. A person is welcome to attend here who doesn't believe. He's not welcome to teach that, promote that. That's what they were doing at Corinth. Bad company corrupts good morals. Stop sinning. Some have no knowledge of God. And he's still talking about the resurrection, verse 15. Some will say, how are the dead raised? What kind of body they come? You know, you always come with a question. Well, you know, like the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection. Here's a woman who died who had seven husbands. How could you have resurrection? She can't have seven husbands in the resurrection. So we ask a question. Well, what kind of body would you have if you're raised from the dead? The bodies we know are a problem. They decay. They're the source of pain and suffering. So what kind of body will you come? Paul's losing patience. You fool. That's the kind of question a person who has no wisdom would answer, ask. That's simply the word wisdom with a negative on the front. That makes you a fool. The book of Proverbs talks about this. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And you sow the bare grain. It's like you put a grain in the ground. And what? A flower comes up. Now it's the same grain But it's transformed. That's what the glorified resurrection body. It will be this body, but it will be totally changed. So that's the the true. It it will be this body. That's what we're talking about. Bodily resurrection. The body that was buried was the body that was raised for Christ. They showed him the wounds in it. He showed uh, his disciples the wounds. His hands, his side. Same body. But the body which is raised has a glory of its own far past. Look around at the flowers that come up in the spring. And think of this passage. They put a seed in the ground. What is that seed? But this flower come out of that seed. You can tell what kind of seed they planted by what kind of flower it is. Oh, they planted a seed for a peach tree and they've got a tulip. That doesn't happen. Um, So it's the same seed, but boy, the transformation. That's what the body that God has prepared for us. We go on to talk about that. The end of the chapter, we're going on into this in our study in Corinthians. We're going to talk about the order of the resurrections. We're going to talk about those who are alive because that's the question at the end. What about those who are alive when Christ comes? They didn't die. How are they going to get a resurrection body? Paul answers that, um, understanding the importance of bodily resurrection. And it's not only believers that are going to be raised from the dead. John chapter 5, we can't go there. Uh, But in John chapter 5, verses 24 to 29, Jesus said, There come a day when he will call all the dead from the tombs. Some will be raised to a resurrection of life with a glorified body. Some will be raised to a resurrection of judgment to be sentenced to an eternal hell. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
the climax of the work of Christ in providing redemption. There's no more glorious truth than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ confirms its truth. That's what you must believe to be saved. And when you believe it, you can be assured that someday your body will experience the same kind of resurrection to glory that the body of Jesus Christ did. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, and your love that had your son come to this earth so that he, in love for us, his enemies, hell-deserving sinners, by believing in what you accomplished in and through him for our salvation was sufficient. It was finished so that we can receive as a free gift your salvation by simply believing in what he has done. We give you praise for a resurrected Savior and we pray in his name. Amen.